of a new social contract. We had to change the social contract. The issue two is devoted to what we learned from the 70s crisis. Well, till the 70s, it was well accepted that inflation and unemployment went in the opposite direction, the famous Phillips curve. But in this situation, in the 70s, all changed, all of a sudden changed. And inflation and unemployment went in the same direction. What's happened? Was the Phillips curve redundant or was it moving? Instability again. Welcome, celebrate instability. The Phillips curve was so fashionable that even analogic machines were built. You have here the version at Monarch, New Zealand Bank. Because the great moderation of the 50s and 60s was followed by the oil crisis that brought to the forefront the role of expectations open and strong academic controversy. There was no mystery on explaining what happened. If the aggregate supply moves up here, there will be a decrease in income and an increase, an increase in unemployment and an increase in inflation. That's a very simple explanation, but for this, you have to, to introduce a new term linking the rate of inflation with the change of, of, of GDP, which is how people form their expectations. And here is where, uh, from the 70s, economics became a social science, because this, we are talking about a social phenomenon, how people create and made up expectations. And that was the beginning of a today still controversy. Shall we use hyper-rational econometricians, as Sargent assumed? Do really citizens are fully rational econometricians? Or do you use adaptive expectations like Friedman, Muth, and myself asked 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Well, Milton Friedman said it very clearly before the crisis. The state of this conclusion, to state the conclusion differently of this moving, there is always a temporary trade-off between inflation and unemployment. There is no permanent trade-off. The temporary, uh, the temporary trade-off comes not from inflation itself, but from the mistakes from anticipate, unanticipated inflation by the citizens. Well, two samples of the controversy of rational expectations that I prefer to call science fiction. Science fiction. Sorry for you. I know this is controversial, so some of you will, will, wouldn't like this position. Rational expectations impose two requirements on economic models, individual rationality and mutual consistency of perceptions. I interpret the proposal to build models with bounded rational agents, as we do, as a call to retreat from the second piece of rational expectations, that is the mutual consistent expectations, by expelling rational agents from our model environments and replacing them with artificial intelligence. Good, that's a good thing. What is wrong is the end of the sentence who behave like an econometrician. I think this is science fiction. Colleagues, it's science fiction, let's face it. Yeah. Well, 40 years later, a world fi financial magnate which created now INET, a very interesting and promising uh, society for looking for real economics, at Berlin conference in two, uh, 2012, said, I'm not well qualified to criticize the theory of rational expectations and the efficient market hypothesis, because as a market participant, I consider them so unrealistic that if I want to make money, this is what I add, I never bothered to study them. That's an indictment in itself, but I shall leave a detailed critique of these theories to others. One of those others is myself. In a paper published in 1981 in the Journal of Econometrics with my brother, Feliciano, called Causality and Independence Phenomenon, we set up the following points. We observe, Nelson observed that time series analysis forecasts with just a single time series were not inferior 
to forecast with large econometric models. This was shocking. How could perform forecasting terms in projective terms, once one time series analysis as, as, as good as the econometric models of the time? Does it mean, we ask, that the econometric models contain serious specification errors? Not necessarily. Probably they were not specification errors. Can rational expectations be equivalent to adapted expectations? That is the main core question of the paper. Yes, they can. Under what experimental evidence? Whenever there is no Granger causality. And is it an exception or a rule for most necessary expectations that there is no Granger causality? Yes, it is a rule. So in general, at the time, a lot of expectations were doing as well as the most uh, select econometrician. Why was this? We can now reinterpret this. But at the time, I couldn't, do, I couldn't say anything like that. If this is so, there were strong implications for macroeconomic modeling. The observed coincidence of efficient extrapolative expectations and rational expectations bounded rational expectations and full rational expectations is more the rule than the an exception for most available historical samples. This was our hunch, our conclusion. But we can now back this claim with a socially inspired metaphor, metaphor which is following. So 30 years after our constructivist with mathematics and filled it with multivariate uh, analysis, conclusion, we can now reinterpret this general equivalence mystery between adaptive expectations and rational ones. What happens? What happens is that there is an equivalence which is supported by the well-known evidence from experimental economics, Bernard Smith and many others, and now from artificial economics, myself and many of you, that groups of people can lead to accurate predictions, the wisdom of the crowds. Emerging collective intelligence from perceptive, just adaptive expectations, yet bounded rational agents can provide accurate expectations, as accurate as, econometri as an econometrician. The exchange window, I call this metaphor, at the rescue of the value window, that is full rationality. Ecological rationality and in feedback and complementing, and putting the limits to constructivist rationality. This is the core of my talk.